you are now listening to British Brothers, the Full Play Podcast. Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases and serial killers. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the ninth episode of season eight. Before we get into it, let's break the ice as always. The show's first opening icebreaker segment is this. Two facts that sound like bullshit. Did you know that the planet Venus rotates so slowly on its axis that one day on Venus last 243 Earth days. So one year on Venus takes only about 225 Earth days. So that means a day on Venus is longer than a year on Venus. <laughs> I don't really understand that. Any one into space can fill me in on that one and tell me if I'm wrong or what the hell it means. Our second and final opening icebreaker segment is this. Final quote of the day. I think there's some connection between absolute discipline an absolute freedom. That was said by legendary actor Alan Rickman, who was born in the area we are focusing on for this week's episode. This week's case was suggested by Sarah Ciccone via email. We're back in the West London suburb of Acton, a place we visited way back in episode one of season four when we looked at the Olga Freeman case. I gave you plenty of facts about Acton during that episode, so I'll refer you there if you want to know more about the area. As of the 2011 census, the estimated population of Acton was 62,480. Let me quickly advise you that this podcast contains elements that may be alarming to some listeners. As always, listener discretion is advised. This case, much like last week's, has an overarching theme. It's not mental health this time, though. It's something referred to as honour-based violence, or HBV. I read up about the various types on the Honor Based Violence Awareness Network's website and my findings were truly distressing. The definition of HBV according to their website is as follows. Honor Based Violence is a phenomenon where a person, most often a woman, is subjected to violence by her collective family or community in order to restore honor. You can't see it but I'm using air quotes when saying that last word. Said honour is presumed to have been lost by said person's behaviour, most often through expressions of sexual autonomy. The most common reasons for HBV, especially against women, are things such as choosing a partner for a relationship that is outside of your family's preferred religion. Other things include dressing too provocatively or not in a style that is deemed respectful, behaving inappropriately with a member of the opposite sex, and being a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Under the general umbrella term of honour-based violence is the most extreme form, honour killing. This is where the family or community believe so strongly that the supposed offender's actions have shamed them that the only way to restore the honour is to murder them. Honour killings are motivated by perceived dishonour to a family or community, but it's worth noting that honour killings do not exclusively occur within the Islamic community, even if the majority do. There have been instances of Sikh and Christian honour killings, but they are rare. I'll give you a couple of frightening stats about honour killings before we get into our story. Did you know that the United Nations Population Fund, a UN agency aimed at improving reproductive and maternal health worldwide, has estimated that 5,000 honour killings occur each year internationally? Of those 5,000, around 1,000 occur in India, and another 1,000 occur in neighbouring Pakistan. But, this is British murders, so I bet you're wondering how many take place on our shores. It's estimated that 12 honour killings occur in the UK each year, but those are only the cases that get reported with the deaths registered. In reality, the number is probably much higher. As you'll hear in this story, the community can be so strongly bonded that cover-ups can undoubtedly occur. Right, there's your background about our topic, let's now get into the actual story. Our villain this week is a man named Abdallah Yones, who was born in the Kurdistan region of northern Iraq, known as Iraqi Kurdistan, or southern Kurdistan, in roughly 1954. 
I went down a huge rabbit hole research in this episode, all about the history of Kurdistan and its desire to seek either independence or autonomy from Iraq. This isn't an armed forces or a history podcast, so I'll spare you the details, but the reason I went down that rabbit hole in the first place is that Abdallah was once a freedom fighter and a member of the political party known as the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. Abdallah fought during the first Gulf War, which occurred from 1990 to 1991, and is said to have suffered several injuries at the hands of Iraq's then-president Saddam Hussein's army. Many of Abdallah's family members died during the war, and he would forever suffer symptoms caused by a chemical weapons attack. What those symptoms were isn't clear. Abdallah, his wife Tanya and their three children, two boys and a girl, fled to the UK and sought asylum in 1991. Their prayers were answered as the UK government granted them indefinite asylum, given Abdallah's military history and his fighting for the side that opposed Saddam Hussein's dictatorship. His family adjusted well to their new life in the UK, but for Abdallah it was a stupendous culture shock that he didn't believe matched the values of his religious beliefs. Some close to Abdallah described him by using the idiom, a fish out of water. Of Abdallah's three children, the one we're focusing on this week was his only daughter, Heshu Yones. Born in 1986, Heshu made the move to the UK with her family when she was just five years old, and she absolutely loved it here. Not one to conform to the expected standards put in place by her strict father, Heshu acted in what Abdallah deemed to be a rebellious way whenever she left the family home. For her secondary education, Heshu attended Acton High School a secondary school located off Gunnersbury Lane in the centre of Acton. Case suggester Sarah Ciccone also attended Acton High and was in Heshu's year, so Sarah will know far more about the school's reputation than me, but here's what my research informed me. Some other former students of Acton High have explained to various media outlets that it didn't have the best reputation. It was known for regular fights happening within its grounds, whilst teachers often left work to discover their cars had been stolen. The place was shut down in 2017 after receiving an inadequate Ofsted report, but it reopened in 2018 as Ark Acton Academy. One thing Acton had more than anything was diversity. Its pupils came from all manner of different ethnic, cultural and religious backgrounds. Heshu was one of the most popular girls at Acton High. Her confidence shone through and she was known by pretty much everyone. There's always that select handful of people at school, isn't there, who everyone knows. They might not know you, but you've definitely heard of them. That was Heshu. Former pupils have described her as a fun-loving girl well into her R&B music, as we all were in the UK at the turn of the millennium. She was free-spirited, the exact opposite of what Abdallah wanted in a daughter, which no doubt frustrated him greatly. In a sense, Heshu lived a double life. At home, she was forced to play the role of a subservient daughter, who did as her father commanded to prevent being beaten. Heshu was on the receiving end of many brutal beatings regardless of how well she tried to play her role at home. I'll admit that my knowledge of Kurdish culture and its traditions is limited and it's not my place to pass comment or judgement, but Heshu? She much preferred western customs. As soon as Heshu left her home, she became a totally different person, her true self if you will. She would hide her makeup in a bag, and once out of sight of her family, quickly apply it before entering the school's halls. She also sought the help of her friends by asking them to cover for her if Abdallah ever asked them where she'd been. At first, like most new students at high school, Heshu was disciplined, punctual and well behaved. She got good grades and seemed to enjoy her time studying as much as she did making new friends. That all began to change in her second and third years. It was around that time that her popularity grew exponentially, and her grades began to suffer slowly as a result. The attention she got, especially from boys, was something that would have driven Abdallah to further beat his daughter more frequently than he already did. By the time Heshu was 16, she had graduated from Acton High and attended a sixth form college called William Morris Academy in Fulham, West London. It's so named after the British textile designer. One of Heshu's fellow pupils was 18-year-old Sam Nizam El Kulri, who was born in the Republic of Lebanon. Not only was Sam Nizam not Iraqi Kurdish, he was also not a Muslim, instead following the Christian faith. 
He was reportedly one of Heshu's older brother's friends, and the pair being an item wasn't exactly something that could be shouted from the rooftops. They saw each other in secret for fear of Abdallah's repercussions. One of my sources seemed to indicate that Abdallah did eventually become aware of Heshu and Samnizam's relationship, but bit his tongue as he believed the relationship was not yet sexual. Major frustrations only seemed to have risen to the surface once Heshu began failing some of her exams. Her overall grades had also begun to slip because, quite simply, she often opted to spend time with Samnizam rather than attend her classes. Playing truant wasn't the only issue. Back in 2002, when this story's main timeline took place, mobile phones were still relatively new contraptions to the general public, and you had to pay for credit. Remember the good old days when the Nokia 32 and 3310s were everywhere? Landlines couldn't be used if someone else was using the internet, which in turn had to be dialed up to connect. Ah, memories. Anyway, Heshu had racked up a few hefty phone bills in 2002. Logically, Sam Nizam was the one she was calling and or texting. Was it 10p a text back then? 10 or 12p, I can't remember. The pair were beginning to make plans to run away together, as Heshu had had just about enough of her father's physical abuse and strict ways. In 2002, Heshu fled her home on three separate occasions during heated arguments with Abdallah and one of her brothers. Each time, the topic of concern was Heshu's not being allowed to start dating. Thankfully, her friends and their families were more than happy to accommodate her whenever she needed a safe place to stay the night. In the summer of 2002, I think it was that July, Abdallah informed his family that he was taking them all back home to Iraqi Kurdistan. Specifically, the city of Slamani, a city in the east of the region, was their intended destination. Before she went, Heshu spoke to some of her friends and expressed her fears that she would be forced into an arranged marriage and become trapped in her home country. One of her friends recalled receiving a copy of Heshu's passport and a secret email address so she could be reached whilst over there. Police would later recover a video of Heshu crying after it was found hidden in her bedroom. The video was taken by Heshu whilst over in Iraqi Kurdistan. In it, she was reportedly upset about how much of a disappointment she felt she was to her father. Heshu wasn't forced into a marriage, but according to her, Abdallah did, at one point, hold a loaded gun to her head and asked her a series of questions about her personal life. Abdallah demanded to know if Heshu was dating anyone and asked her outright if she was still a virgin. Not happy with the answers he received, Abdallah is said to have forced Heshu to undergo a virginity test, which he subsequently failed. If you're like me, you'll have never heard of a virginity test. Maybe you've all heard of it and I'm the naive odd one out. Here's a quick side note nonetheless. Virginity testing and hymenoplasty, also known as hymen repair surgery, were topics discussed in an independent report published on the 23rd of December 2021 by the Department of Health and Social Care. The report came after an August 2021 position statement published by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, RCOG, which called for a ban on virginity testing and hymenoplasty. In simple terms, a virginity test checks whether or not a woman's or girl's hymen has been stretched open. If so, the result will come back stating she is not a virgin. Hymenoplasty is a form of genital cosmetic surgery that repairs the hymen, thus making it appear as if whoever the surgery was performed on is still a virgin. Both practices are based on repressive and inaccurate views about female virginity and the hymen, and rightly so, classed as violence against women and girls, or VAWG. The report from the Department of Health and Social Care stated, Following widespread concern that some young women and girls are being coerced and forced to have their virginity tested and subsequently undergoing hymen repair surgery, the Department of Health and Social Care and the Home Office undertook an intensive review to consider if government intervention was needed. It concluded that there is no reason why a virginity test should be carried out and confirmed it is not a recognised medical procedure. It is a form of abuse that has detrimental physical and psychological impacts on women and girls. This next part really shocked me. It was only made illegal to carry out, offer or aid and abet virginity testing or hymenoplasty in any part of the UK in 2022, after introducing the Health and Care Act 2022. It was only made illegal last year. How bad is that? By the way, it's also illegal for UK nationals and residents to perform such procedures outside the UK. 
The story will continue after these quick messages. And now, back to the story. Let's get into our main timeline, which starts on October 10th, 2002. That was the day Abdallah Yearns received an anonymous letter from an unknown third party whilst working as a volunteer at the PUK offices in South London. The letter, written entirely in Kurdish, intended to inform Abdallah about his daughter's behaviour with the opposite sex, and the words used to describe her were offensive and outdated. Heshu was labelled a slut by the letter's sender, with her behaviour being compared to a prostitute. I'm using air quotes again. The fact Heshu had a boyfriend appeared to be well known in the community, and the letter was a way of informing Abdullah of that. Crumpling up and throwing away the letter in anger, Abdallah was furious to learn that his daughter was regularly sleeping with her boyfriend. Abdallah claims the letter left him feeling ashamed, furious and sick to his stomach. At first, he kept his cool. He wanted to wait a little while until his temper had dampened before he spoke to Heshu about what he had read. Two days later, on October 12, 2002, Abdallah decided it was the right time for the difficult conversation, as the pair had been left alone together in the flat. It's unclear on what day she handed it to her dad, but Heshu had written a letter of her own, a goodbye letter. Her plans to run away from home with Samnizam were edging closer to becoming a reality, and informing her dad was the last piece of the puzzle. The letter read, Bye dad, sorry I was so much trouble. Me and you will probably never understand each other, but I'm sorry I wasn't what you wanted, but there's some things you can't change. Hey, for an older man, you have a good, strong punch and kick. I hope you enjoyed testing your strength on me. It was fun being on the receiving end. Well done. One day when I have got a proper job, every penny I owe you will be repaid in full. I'm sure in saying I will be safe. I will find a way to independently look after myself. I will go to social security and get myself a flat or hostel. I will be okay. Don't look for me because I don't know where I'm going yet. I just want to be alone. On the morning of October 12th, Heshu was in a bit of a panicked state. She was so close to being able to run away, but financially she still needed a bit of help. She called one of her friends but received no answer, so instead opted to leave a voicemail. In it, Heshu asked to borrow some money to help her escape the nightmare that was living at home with her father. As the day went on, Heshu made some more calls to her friends, including one to a female friend. Bizarrely, the friend answered the phone, heard Heshu say hello, but the call then reportedly ended abruptly, a few seconds after connecting. Abdallah may have heard Heshu on the phone to that friend and become paranoid about who she was talking to. Some sources claim his hearing her on the phone prompted the attack I'm about to describe. In a frenzied and unprovoked attack that lasted around a quarter of an hour, Abdallah Yones chased his daughter around the house with a kitchen knife in his hand. The 16-year-old did her best to defend herself from her dad's onslaught and thought she'd made it to safety when she barricaded herself inside a bathroom. Fueled by pure rage, Abdallah's strength was too much for the locked door and he burst through it with ease. With nowhere to go, Heshu was defenseless. Using the kitchen knife, Abdallah stabbed his daughter several times before finally slitting her throat as her body lay prone over the edge of the bath. His knife swings were so ferocious that the tip of the blade broke off during the attack. In total, Heshu was stabbed between 11 and 18 times, depending on which source you believe. She suffered wounds to her hands, face, body and neck, including a severed jugular vein. Abdallah felt that the murder was justified to restore the honour Heshu's behaviour had shamed the family into losing. Even so, he claimed to have no recollection of carrying out the attack or even where he acquired the knife from. Once Heshu was dead, Abdallah realised what he'd done. He had murdered his only daughter and destroyed his whole family. Not wanting to live through the guilt, Abdallah attempted to take his own life by slitting his throat and jumping out of one of the flat's windows. The flat was located on the third floor of a tower block in Acton called Charles Hocking House. Abdallah's suicide attempt ultimately failed after a neighbour phoned the police. They had spotted Abdallah laying prone on the pavement covered in blood. Emergency services soon arrived and Abdallah was taken to hospital where he remained for the next few months. A search of the flat led to police officers discovering the body of Heshu Yones in the bathroom. Her body had allegedly been wedged between the toilet and bath. Here's where the community aspect of honour killings comes into play. 
When questioned by police, Heshu's mum and one of her brothers explained that her murder must have been caused by a burglary gone wrong. That story raised a few eyebrows as nothing had been stolen, although the flat will likely have been in disarray. It took a few months for Abdallah to be in a fit enough state to be questioned by police, but when he was, his theory as to who had killed Heshu was bizarre. He claimed that operatives working for the terrorist group Al-Qaeda were responsible. The reason was revenge for all the work Abdallah had put in opposing Saddam Hussein's regime in the 1980s. I wondered how the two connected, so I did a little bit of digging. There's a conspiracy theory out there that suggests a highly secretive relationship existed between Saddam and Al-Qaeda between 1992 and 2003. As far as conspiracy theories go, that was a new one on me. With Abdallah's statement now on record, the police could begin speaking with his family members and the local community, which included several of Heshu's friends. They revealed that Heshu was apparently living a hellish life at home and had been on the end of beatings by her father for at least a year. Heshu also regularly wrote and received love letters, which she hid in her room, but when the police later searched her room, no letters were found. Therefore, the letters either didn't exist, or, what's more likely, other members of her family had disposed of them. When Tanya, Abdallah's wife and Heshu's mum, was questioned by the police, she informed them that the day of her murder was a day like any other. It was peaceful. Tanya had left the flat shortly after half five on the evening of October 12th with the younger of her two sons. Tanya could give the precise time she left the flat, 5.38pm, to the officers, which struck them as odd. Tanya also informed them that she recalled leaving the front door unlocked. That was likely an attempt to further fuel the fire towards the authorities believing the theory of intruders having murdered Heshu. Several women in the Kurdish community came forward and urged the police to look further into Heshu's death, as they didn't believe she was killed by who her family told them she was. Police were also bombarded by other members of the Kurdish community who believed Abdallah was innocent, or they were covering up for him. Some people even tried to raise bail money for Abdallah's release, but it was declined after the police informed the community they had it on good authority that Abdallah would go on the run once bailed. It's not clear what led to the arrest of Abdallah or on what day it happened, but based on what I've told you, it sounds like it will have been a pretty open and shut case for the police. Abdallah eventually admitted to having murdered Heshu and pleaded guilty to the murder charge he faced. By doing so, Abdallah Jones became the first person in UK legal history to admit having carried out an honour killing. He reportedly begged the case judge Neil Dennison to hand him a death sentence, but as you know, the death penalty has been abolished in the UK. On September 29th, 2003, Judge Dennison handed Abdallah Jones a life sentence with a minimum term of 14 years, less than seven months and six days spent in custody on remand. In his sentencing statement, Judge Dennison said, This is, on any view, a tragic story arising out of irreconcilable cultural differences between traditional Kurdish values and the values of Western society. It is plain you strongly and genuinely disapproved of the lifestyle in this country of your daughter and the fact that it was affecting her schoolwork. But, having said that, the killing and the manner of it was, as you have recognised, an appalling act. That is why immediately after and then again last month, you tried to take your own life. I accept it is still your intention, but there is only one sentence that the law allows me to pass where the crime is murder, and that is the sentence I do pass. Life. Heshu's murder sparked a review by the Metropolitan Police of numerous suspicious death cases that occurred between 1993 and 2003. An article published in November 2005 stated that, at that point, over 100 cases had been reopened. 22 of those had been fully examined, with 18 of those 22 being reclassified or remaining as suspected honour killings. Fast forward to October 2021, and you may be surprised to hear that the total number of honour-based abuse cases has increased massively in the two decades since Heshu was murdered. HBA cases, including offences such as rape, death threats and assault, rose from 884 in 2016 to 1,599 in 2020. That's a rise of 81%. Those stats are frightening. And that was the story of Abdallah and Heshu Yones. Thanks again, Sarah Ciccone, for suggesting that case. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. 
I've got another nine reviews to read out this week, so bear with me for this outro. Lemon Skunk123 left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts titled Fantastic. It reads, Love this podcast. I very rarely write a review, but feel this dude deserves one. I've binged your podcast while I'm at work and I've got friends to start listening. Feels weird sometimes you're talking about cutting up a body and me being a butcher. Love the podcast. Keep them coming. I will keep on listening. Terry left a five-star review on BritishMurders.com titled Bedtime Listening. It reads, Hubby and I listen to British Murders at night. We've listened to lots of serial killer slash murder podcasts, and this is a firm favourite. Cheerio. Stephen G left a five-star review on BritishMurders.com titled Great Show. It reads, I've just recently started listening to the podcast, and it's nice to hear someone who lives in the UK, so they know the areas of all the crimes other than a rough idea. Liv left a five-star review on BritishMurders.com titled Relax. It reads, Such a relaxing podcast giving you both the murderer's side and the victim slash witness's side of the story. I love these episodes, and the intro music is incredible. Shout out to David John Brady for my intro music, please check him out. Amy Bo Smith recommended British Murders on Facebook by saying, I love the British Murders podcast, partly because I know a few of the places. I love that they are not too long, but give enough detail. I drive round loads for work, so it is currently giving me plenty to listen to, as I have started from season one. Nice to see how Stuart advances and changes for his audience going from season to season. Matthew Skett recommended British Murders on Facebook by saying, This is a brilliant podcast. I have binged it from start to present and I can't get enough. The episodes are just the right length and his voice is very easy to listen to. Just wish I had stumbled on the podcast much later so I would have more episodes to binge. Two episodes a week would be better, but there isn't enough hours in the day. Keep going, mate. Can I suggest the case of Georgia Williams from Telford, Shropshire? Keep up the good work. I've added that case to my spreadsheet for you, Matthew. For extra episodes, may I suggest joining the Patreon? I do release fortnightly bonus episodes on there. That's the only extra content I can manage currently. Hopefully that'll change one day. Marlow Rule left a five-star review on BritishMurders.com titled Five Stars from Australia. It reads, Hi Stuart, I started listening to British Murders in January of this year after my mum recommended it to me and I've been binging it ever since. The show is well researched and your presentation style is so friendly and engaging. If you read this out, please give a shout out to my mum. Her name is Anna. Keep up the brilliant work. Hello Anna, thank you for the recommendation. Button Gear left a five-star review on BritishMurders.com titled Fantastic Podcast. It reads, Love true crime. Love the chatter along with the topic. Side facts, dad facts. Truly enjoy everything in this podcast. Don't go changing. You do you. You're killing it. Pun intended. And finally, Tarleen left a five-star review on BritishMurders.com titled One of the Best. It reads, One of the best true crime podcasts. Love the Yorkshire accent, the humour, and also the humility in which Stuart recounts some of the UK's most horrific stories. Thank you, Lemon Skunk123, Terry, Stephen, Liv, Amy, Matthew, Marlow Rule, Button Gear, and Tallinn for leaving the show such lovely reviews. Suppose you'd like to leave a review of the show and have it read on a future episode, you can do so on iTunes, Facebook, Podchaser, or at BritishMurders.com. You can also leave star ratings on Spotify. If you'd like to support the show on Patreon or donate on a one-off basis via Buy Me A Coffee, you can find the links for each on my website. Thank you, Claire Weir, for buying me three beers at buymeacoffee.com slash BritishMurders. The note left said, Your podcasts are brilliant. have been listening for about a year. My favourite true crime podcast. Please continue emailing case suggestions to BritishMurdersPodcast at gmail.com or message me via social media. You'll not only get the episode covered, but you'll also get a cheeky little shout out. That's it for another episode. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.